Hello everyone and welcome to the Midweek Bible Class with Pastor Steve. Today is a little different than most days in that I'm doing it in the afternoon. This is a live broadcast, 1 p.m. on Wednesday. And for those of you joining in, glad to have you. My guess is we'll have a small group in the daytime today. The reason we're filming in the daytime is because next Monday, I'm going to be in the Las Vegas area visiting my daughter. And yes, I will take precautions on the airplane and uh, um, be careful, but it's one of those opportunities where air flights are really, really cheap, and I have a daughter on the other end of the country, and so I'm just gonna take a few days to travel over there and enjoy a little visit. And uh, we're gonna begin in prayer in just a moment, but for those of you who watch the class, know that I have uh, what I often call the teacher's pet, somebody who's very precious to me, and it's a woman named Mary Lilia, and uh, she's not too big on technology. I'm not sure she's gonna be watching today, but she is just so precious. She is uh, 89 years old, and uh, God has blessed her with health, but she called me today and uh, asked for prayer. Um, she just has uh, something going on with her body that she wants to be uh, placing before the Lord. We don't think it's the virus or anything like that, but the bottom line is she's precious to us. And many of you who come to this class, particularly when we meet live, you, you'll know Mary. Um, and so could we bind ourselves together right now and pray for our sister that God would take good care of this precious saint and then we'll begin our class. Father, we thank you so much that you love us. And in the midst of this Corona crisis, we, we know we're not abandoned, we're not alone. You are here, you are our preserver, our protector. And I know I, for one, wake up with confidence in the morning that you do love me and care for me. And Lord, I place that confidence and hope right now on our sister, Mary Lilia. She is precious to us, and the fact that she called me requesting prayer means it's kind of big for her. And we ask that you would just take care of the sister. We love her, and we pray that the son, your son's hand would be upon her now, the healing hand of Jesus Christ our Lord. And so as we have our class together today, we do so in a spirit of prayer for somebody that we love very much. And we pray now, Lord, for our greater congregation because she is not the only one who is feeling ill, and some people have succumbed to uh, serious illness relating to this COVID-19, and we haven't forgotten that, Lord. We pray for our body. We pray for our friends. We pray for our children. We pray for our parents. And in all and through all, we're asking that you will bring this to a swift end and somehow, Lord, in a way that's mysterious to us, bring glory to yourself in all and through all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's great to be with you again, even if I can't literally be with you. I am once again speaking to an empty room here in the Manhasset campus in uh, Fellowship Hall. And because it is daytime, it is actually possible that somebody may walk in and uh, interrupt my flow of thought. Uh, but the good side is if that happens, it at least will give me a feeling that I'm not teaching to myself only. Uh, there will be somebody physically present maybe who might be walking by. We'll see if that happens. I don't know. So we're continuing our journey through the book of Isaiah. And today we're going to be looking at a chapter which is very important theologically. In fact, it has one of the most important theological phrases in the book, in the Bible. Um, I say that. Now there's a lot of important theological phrases. I don't want to overplay it. But what I mean is... Virtually every uh, pastoral council, meaning where they're questioning a young man as to his credentials for ministry. Does he know the Bible well enough? Usually, Isaiah 55 will come up because it has a very important verse on understanding the nature of God and also our ability to process things like COVID-19. I mean, how do you figure that the, the very common phrase, if God is good, how could he allow something bad to happen? Well, we're going to be dealing with that a little bit today in the verses we're going to look at. But before we do that, we are diving into our quiz. Yes, boys and girls, we have a quiz again today. And if you're viewing for the first time, that may surprise you, but I am a sadistic teacher who likes to torture his students. 
If you ever want to take the quiz in advance of a class, you go to the Shelter Rock Church website, and then on the right-hand corner, you see a button that says Resources. Click on that. Below that, you see Midweek Bible Class. Click on that. And it's usually updated uh, at least a couple hours before class with the, the day's quiz. And this one is quiz number nine. It is on the website right now. And uh, if you haven't looked at it, you can look at it later. Um, but now we're going to go over the answers. And you can just follow along and see how you do. But the idea of this quiz is to build on one's learning. So if you haven't been in this class regularly, this quiz will come across to you like, what? Who can know these questions? And the answer is, my class can know these questions. And I'm proud to say that generally speaking, those who take this class get usually six or seven out of 10 right. Um, and that is quite honestly amazing because if we handed out this quiz to the general public, they would probably get two, maybe three right at best. And I'm referring to the general Christian public. And so if you're getting five, six, seven, eight right on these quizzes, it shows you've been reading the book and you've been paying attention in class. So let's dig in and see what we can learn as we continue our class, the Gospel of Isaiah, the best is yet to come. Here we go. Quiz number nine, chapter intro, introduction, which is chapter 40, to chapter 54. Chapter, uh, excuse me, question one. It is surprising that the servant of Isaiah, chapters 52, 53, is said to be, okay, here we go, not attractive, Suffering, lifted up and highly exalted, carries our iniquities. Now, if you look at it, the truth is all of them are in the text. But the idea of being surprising, being, you might say, unattractive, I mean, you might say lots of people have. It's not ultimately surprising. Now, suffering, yeah, I actually, if I was filling this out, you could put all four of these. But I really wanted to focus on the two which are shocking. And that's why I highlighted these as the right answer. The first one is C, lifted up and highly exalted. This phrase in Isaiah shows up two other times. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1. You might remember a very famous passage. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And the second one is going to be in our class next week, where the Lord is referred to as high and exalted. And now, the servant of the Lord, the one who is ultimately suffering, the one who is actually described as not very attractive, is high and exalted. How can this be? Well, this is a wonderful depiction of a verse that conveys the deity of Jesus Christ. Because you do not walk away from Isaiah 53 easily without thinking about Jesus. For those of the, who are skeptical, to thought that this is describing the crucifixion uh, of Jesus in such detail 700 years before it happened is absolutely stunning and amazing. But then to read that that servant is high and exalted conveys deity. Now here's the other amazing thing. It's D. He carries our iniquities. How is that possible? That makes no sense in terms of the rest of the biblical narrative. Everyone dies for their own sins when you read the, the Hebrew scriptures. And the only time there is this carrying of iniquities is when you read in the book of Leviticus, we talked about this last week, when they place the sins of the people on a goat, which in Hebrew is called the Azel. And when they place this on, uh, the sins on this goat, the end result is they send this goat out of town, never to be seen again. And we now have a situation in which a person is carrying our iniquities, and we come to realize that Jesus is, this Messiah, this servant, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and that somehow our sins were placed on him. 
Those two things, C and D on this, are shocking to us. Absolutely shocking. The other two are surprising. But once again, you could put all four as correct, but it is those last two that are the ones that really surprise us. Next one. Barren women, women who cannot have children, will A, cry, B, sing, C, expand their homes, D, grieve. And the surprising answer is two of them. They are going to sing and they're going to expand their homes. This is a prophecy of Isaiah to the women in Babylon, and it's really referring metaphorically to the people of Israel. And this idea is they're in slavery. There's no hope. What are they going to do? They're, they're broken. And the Lord says, barren women, they're going to sing. In fact, God is going to open their wombs to the degree that they're going to have to expand their houses. And in a Hebraic tradition, having children is everything. It shows you have stature. It shows you have the blessing of God. And we, we compared this last week to Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Do you remember Hannah? She is the prophet Samuel's mom. She's married to a man named Elkanai. And Elkanai knows that Hannah can't have children. He, he grieves for her and he, he loves her. And he gives her always the double portion of, of, his, of his wives. Yes, he has many wives. But the end result is that Hannah is not satisfied until she has a baby and God opens her womb and she conceives and gives birth to what becomes the prophet Samuel. And that passage is very helpful just to convey the grieving process. That is a very important person in the Bible and one that clearly influenced Mary, the mother of Jesus. But that's another story. Number three, who is your husband? Okay, here's a surprise. This applies to guys and uh, women. So is it Israel, metaphorically speaking? Is it your faith? Is it your maker? Is it King Cyrus? Hmm, what is it? You know, here it is, it's your maker. This is an imagery which is ultimately picked up in the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible when we are called Christians, the bride of Christ. And here, God is described in this beautiful way as our husband. Um, and you can, again, it's for men and women and uh, beautifully described. If you want to know where this comes from, it's Isaiah 54, verse 5, which reads this way. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. What a beautiful thing. That's the kind of relationship that God sees with you. We had just mentioned a few weeks ago that God has written on the palm of his hand, your name. That's what it says in the text. His point is, I will never forget you. Never forget you. You know, when I was praying for Mary this morning on the phone, I mentioned that, and she got emotional. <coughs> I understand why. I get emotional when I think of that. We all want to be known. We all want to be seen. But to think that the creator of all things knows you, has your name on the palm of his hand, and says, you are my bride. I am your husband. Very powerful imagery that encourages us to know we are not forgotten. So we move on. Number four, God compares his new covenant with his people to the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic Covenant, the Adamic Covenant. Okay, lots of covenants in the Old Testament. And they all convey different things. What is it? It is the Noahic Covenant. And what is the Noahic Covenant? It is when God placed a rainbow in the sky and said that there would never be any more um, any, him destroying the world by a flood. And a very beautiful image and uh, these days, of course, a rainbow has come to mean uh, different things, but I, I get a kick out of my wife. I said this last week when my kids were young and they said, uh, Mommy, why are they displaying the rainbow here? 
and uh, my wife knew the real reason they were displaying the rainbow, but she would say to them, they're celebrating the Noahic Covenant. You remember how when God promised through the rainbow that he would never destroy the earth again through a flood? Well, that's what that celebrates. And of course the kids say, oh, okay, thank you. I, I love that though, and it helps redeem to me uh, the idea of the rainbow. Here we go. How many stanzas does the song of the suffering servant have? Now the song of the suffering servant begins at the end of Isaiah 52, and it continues through all of Isaiah 53. And we mentioned last week, the only way you'd know the answer to this is if you were in the class last week. But it's treated as a song, you could say a poem, and the question is, does it have three stanzas? Four, five, or six? And the answer is, it has five stanzas, five stanzas. Now, I'm gonna show you a slide I showed last week to give you a breakdown. Um, and as I mentioned uh, last week, you know what? I forgot to put that slide in there. Oh well, I have to show it. What I, what I wanted to show you is just a slide that conveyed um, the differences of the stanzas and where those lines are. I thought I had put it in the, the quiz, but I have not. Um, so the answer is five stanzas. The first one is spoken by God. The second one by witnesses. The third one by witnesses who are coming to get, gain understanding. In other words, they're beginning to understand who this servant is. The fourth one is Isaiah. And the fifth stanza is Isaiah and the Lord. Isaiah and the Lord. I may have given away an answer to another question as we move forward too. So here we go. Next one. Which of the following is not one of the singers of the servant song? Which of the following is not one of the singers of the servant song? A, the wise, B, the witnesses, C, the Lord, and D, Isaiah. Now, if you were paying attention, boys and girls, to what I just previously said, you would know I, I gave the answer away. The one that does not fit is the wise. That is not one of the singers of this song. However, witnesses are people who are observing the servant. The Lord clearly is in the beginning and at the end. And Isaiah seems to be, it's a, it's a single voice, single personal pronoun, which conveys it's one person. Thus, it's probably Isaiah. Ah, here's the slide I was looking for. So here's the breakdown as it stands. And this is the text, which I know there's no way in God's green earth you can read that on the internet, on your, your phone or some little picture. But this you can probably read. And it stands at one, begins in Isaiah 52, verse 13 to 14. God is speaking. And it's, uh, it says here, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be uh, raised and lifted up and highly exalted. And so God speaks. Then we move to stanza 2, which is the beginning of Isaiah 53. And witnesses speak. And they begin with, Who has believed our message? And who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And this is the sense of like the early apostles that nobody believes their message that God would send a Messiah who would end up crucified. It makes no sense. And then it goes to the next stanza, stanza three. The witnesses begin to see. Surely he took up our uh, pain and bore our suffering. It's like the pieces are coming together that what the service, servant did he did for us, and, and it's starting to make sense. And then we move to uh, stanza four, where one lone witness, arguably by the personal pronoun, that is possibly Isaiah, that's why I have a question mark here, and then it's, it, it goes on to say, um, you know, more descriptions. He was uh, oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open up his mouth. As he was led as a lamb before the slaughter, so the sheep before his uh, shearers is silent, so he did not open up his mouth. Um, and that sounds like Isaiah. And finally, Isaiah, uh, excuse me, 53, 10 to 12, stands at 5, Isaiah and God speaks. First part is Isaiah, and then God speaks that I am going to raise him up and bring him glory. Last week's passage. 
Isaiah 53. It's so moving, so powerful. Um, and if you have not invested some time into studying Isaiah 52, 53, it is worth every moment that you do that. And if you got time during this COVID-19 where we're trapped in our houses, by all means, dig into Isaiah 53, reflect on it, pray about it, celebrate it, and enjoy the gift that God has given us. A prophecy of Jesus 700 years before he was born about the Messiah. Beautiful. Next one. Seven. Some argue through Isaiah uh, 53 that there is blank in the atonement. Some argue through Isaiah 53 that there is blank in the atonement. So the answers would be one of these. That there is works in the atonement. That there is healing in the atonement. That there is sacrifice in the atonement. And that there is penance in the atonement. Now, if you were in class last week and you're like, wow, I, I don't remember him talking about that. You know why? I didn't talk about it. And I should have. And so I th thought I would throw it in the class. Now, here's the verse that is at play. It's uh, Isaiah. Um, let me look it up exactly so I give you the, the reference. It's Isaiah 53, verse 5, which says this. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Or, yeah, we are healed. It's that last phrase that many argue that there is healing in the atonement. In other words, when Christ died on the cross, it not only bought our salvation, but it brought about the possibility for physical healing. Now, is that a fair observation of this text? You'll actually have a lot of debate amongst people, and if you looked it up on the internet, you'd see a lot of discussion about that. But when you look linguistically at the word healed, in the Hebrew language, it specifically means physical healing. It can mean metaphorical healing, but it is very possible to see in Christ's death healing available for us. Now, there are certain denominations like the Christian Missionary Alliance, uh, their founder, A.B. Simpson, he was healed. And when he came up with the pillars of his faith, uh, of the denomination that he ended up founding, the Christian Missionary Alliance, one of the pillars is the belief in healing in the atonement. Uh, years ago, we're probably talking 17 years ago, well, one of the elders of the church, um, actually, uh, uh, we were talking in, the, in an elder meeting, and, and somebody made a comment that uh, that's a silly thing to think that there's healing in the atonement. But I knew that the elder sitting next to me came from a Christian Missionary Alliance background. And I said to the person who made the comment, you might want to be a little careful because in this room is somebody who came from a denomination that affirms the healing and the atonement. And the man knew I was calling him out. And it was just kind of a funny moment. And I, I will argue, I think biblically you can make a good case that there is healing in the atonement of Jesus Christ. It is not a name and claim it kind of thing. But when Jesus died on the cross, it is the great restoration. It is restoring sinful people to be in a right relationship with God. And secondly, it's restoring sick people to be in a healthy relationship with God. Here's a passage in Luke, I believe it is, Luke 17, Luke 18, if I have it right, it's also possible to be Luke 13. I'm mixing them up in my mind. But there's a woman who comes into the synagogue, and she's all hunched over. And the Pharisees are all wondering what she's going to do. Is he going to heal her? And Jesus heals her. But before he does, he says to the people who are skeptical, because, you know, it's the Sabbath, and you're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath because they viewed it as a work. 
And Jesus says, this woman is a daughter of Abraham. And the next phrase is intriguing. Jesus says, ought she not be well? Shouldn't she be well by virtue of being a daughter of Abraham? And then Jesus heals her. And the beautiful thing is that Jesus is saying, I am restoring that which is broken in this world, person by person, case by case. And therefore, I think we should live with the op optimism that there is an ought for the way things should be in terms of our health and our spiritual well-being. So, is there healing in the atonement? B, yes, I think that that is a viable, arguable point. Next one, eight. Ah, do I have two sevens here? I do. Oh no, it's the same one, just repeated. <laughs> so let me go on to the next one. Ah, oh, seems like I'm missing a question there. Hey, we'll figure it out. King Cyrus is surprisingly called by God his A, Messiah, B, Shepherd, C, Champion, D, Son. King Cyrus is surprisingly called by God his, and the answer is, Messiah and Shepherd. So here is a pagan king being called Messiah and also being called Shepherd. Um, it's surprising. It's what is in the text. And so that's an older question from uh, previous classes. Uh, you may not know that. He is not called the champion, although he does function as one. And he's not called God's son. But he is called Messiah. Messiah, basically, it only means anointed one. And so King David is an anointed one. Could be called Messiah. Jesus is the ultimate Messiah, God's son. That's the difference. And he's called the shepherd, King Cyrus. Next one. A voice of one calling in the wilderness is probably A, God, B, Isaiah, C, John the Baptist, and D, Cyrus. So, a voice crying in the wilderness. This is from Isaiah chapter 40, which is A, B, C, or D. And the answer is, whoops, wrong direction. It is John the Baptist. We believe it is uh, John the Baptist. Now, my wife puts together this PowerPoint for me, and I think it is clear that she skipped a question. And it is interesting that she skipped the question. Uh, I think because it, I, I confused her on it, but I'm pretty sure it is on the sheet if you figured it out. And so I'm gonna go to my computer here and see if I can bring it up in a different format just so you can see it. So bear with me one moment here and see if I can get it. I am putting on my glasses because I'm blind as a bat without it here. Okay. There we are. It is question eight on the screen. Of course, it doesn't show on the screen here. Let me see if I can fix that. There we go. Okay, question eight. Which of the following does not refer to God's people? Israel, Jacob, Zion, and Jerusalem. So that was on the quiz that's on the website. For some reason, it didn't make the PowerPoint. Um, but why this question is important to see is because there's no right answer. This is the first time in all the times that I have done this Bible class that I had an answer, a question that had no right answer. And the reason is because Israel is God's people. Jacob is Israel's other name. It refers to God's people. Zion, another name for Jerusalem, 
refers to God's people. And finally, Jerusalem itself refers to God's people. And so I didn't want to miss the precedent here that there is the possibility that there might be no answers right. So that's what we see here. I just wanted not to miss that question if you see it. So let me go back and put the PowerPoint up again. Okay. So now we're going to dig into the material today. And as I mentioned, Isaiah 55 is a very important theological passage. If you have a Bible open, let's open it now to Isaiah 55, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read the whole chapter, and then we'll go back and break it down. Okay, here's what we read. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that me you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations and uh, you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And our God, he will freely pardon, mercy on him. And to our God, he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return without water in the earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So it is with my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst in the song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper. Instead of the briars and the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that salvation uh, will endure forever. Now, if you recognize anything from this passage that I just read, uh, I would not surprise me. And if you are somebody who has had your nose in the Bible on a regular basis, you have bumped into some of these verses. If you've been listening to preachers on the radio, on TV, on, on uh, YouTube, you will bump into verses in this passage. This is a glorious section, and it is argued to be a closing section. In other words, it began in Isaiah 40. When we began this part of the class, we call it Isaiah part two. But Isaiah one to 39 is all leading up to the Assyrian attempt to conquer Jerusalem. All asking one simple question, who are you gonna trust? And the people are encouraged, trust the Lord. And ultimately that's what happens, Jerusalem under King Hezekiah prays, God help us, the Assyrians are at our gate, and God delivers them, and the Assyrians are defeated. But then, Isaiah 39 prophetically says the day is going to come when Jerusalem will not be faithful, and they will be conquered by a foreign nation called Babylon. And Isaiah, even though he is writing 150 years before this stuff happens, he receives a prophetic word to a people who are in captivity in Babylon. And that begins Isaiah 40, which begins with these words, to that captive people, comfort, comfort my people, your hard service is over. And so we have been going through these passages that are spoken to a people to encourage them that it's time to go back to Jerusalem. 
It is time to see the unfolding hand of the Lord. Now, I would argue that Isaiah 53, last week's uh, passage, is kind of the climax, pointing to this servant, we would argue Jesus, Yeshua, that is going to come and be the one who carries our iniquities. Uh, Isaiah 54 transitions us to this climactic passage, chapter 55, which culminates these servant songs and lets us see a preferred future, a glorious future. The next chapter we're going to look at brings us, chapter 56, to the end of the book of Isaiah, the last 10 chapters. And so what we're going to see is just a combination of, uh, basically, there's three sections of the book, 1 to 39, 40 to 55, and then 56 to 66. Let's look now at the beginning of chapter 55, and we read this. Now, mind you, we're coming right out of the, the servant passage of Jesus suffering, or the Messiah, or the servant suffering for the iniquities of the people. And then it says this, the Lord is speaking. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Now, that sounds funny. Come, buy, and eat. And come to waters. Does this sound familiar in any way to you? Now, I'm talking to my more biblically literate students. There is a book in the Bible that never quotes the Old Testament but it alludes to the Old Testament more than any other book in the New Testament. You know what book that is? I wish I could see a hand right now. And the answer is Revelation. Now, let me give you some pictures here. This is Revelation 21, so the end of the Bible. He said to me, it is done. This is Jesus speaking, actually. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Now, this actually alludes to this passage in Isaiah, and it also alludes to a passage in Jeremiah, where Jeremiah says, my people have made two mistakes. They have forsaken me, the wellspring of life, and they have in turn tried to satisfy themselves with water from broken cisterns. In other words, stagnant water that isn't even holding water. But what the author of Revelation does, John, he combines these thoughts into his passage, which emanates and flows from our Isaiah passage here. This shows that we get at the end of Revelation, chapter 22. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. Now, I grew up with a lot of youth group songs. And if Pastor Jack Crabtree was here, I could start singing and he would know the song. Because I, I used to sing this in Campus Life Youth Group. It went like this. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. And it has motions. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Open prison door sets the captives free. I got a river of life flowing out of me. That song flows from this passage, as well as Isaiah 61 and, and other passages where this river of life is mentioning, and in Revelation. And so you see here how one scripture gives birth to another scripture in a very beautiful way. At this, this week, uh, Pastor Nathan and I were on a Zoom phone call. And one of the people in the phone call asked the question, okay, I'm gonna to go to seminary. What should I do in terms of classes? Should I take New Testament survey first or should I take Old Testament survey first? And Pastor Nathan answered first and he said, I think you should take the New Testament. That is the dominant uh, pole of our faith. You know, we, we are New Testament people, New Covenant people, so take the New Testament survey. And I said, I have to beg to differ with Pastor Nathan because 
the Old Testament is the key to understanding the New Testament. Now, I wish you didn't need it, but you do. You need to know what's in the Hebrew Scriptures to have a full understanding of what is in the New Testament. Otherwise, you're always trying to like, what's this deal with circumcision? Or what's this deal with festivals? And, and what's the big deal with the Sabbath? And you're constantly asking those kind of questions. Here is an example. We're having a foundation of what's in the past helps us. But here's the big idea of this first verse. What is the big idea of Isaiah? Come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters, you who have no money. It is grace because the servant carried our iniquities. Because I am now clean by the grace of God, now I drink from the water freely. And this is depicted in Paul's writing in Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 8 to 10. Worth memorizing, if you haven't done it already. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this not from yourselves. You did squat all it to get this. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That is what this passage is about. How do we live in grace? How does that change everything? And what it does is receive the blessings of God, the forgiveness of God, not because you paid money for it, not because you earned it, but because he just has graciously given it to you. So he goes on to say, why spend money, verse 2, on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? So now the Lord repeats himself twice. And uh, just like Charles Stanley, when he preaches and goes, listen now, listen, here's what God says. Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest fare. So let me ask you, what is good? What is good to eat? On Sunday, I was uh, preaching, and you may have uh, saw me preaching with a, with a meal in front of me, and I made a blooper. I was referring to a restaurant in, in Illinois called Culver's, and I wanted to say it's kind of like a high, up, upscale, fast food restaurant, similar to maybe Friendly's, but I left out the fast food phrase. So what did I say? I said it's like an upscale restaurant like Friendly's, and when I saw that, when I played back what I preached, I was like, nah, why did I do that? So I, I in, in humor, I sent a letter to the staff and said, hey, when this whole COVID-19 thing's over, I want to take the whole staff out to an upscale restaurant, friendlies. And of course, they all got a kick out of that. But if you're choosing what to eat spiritually, eat good food, what is it? It's the scripture. It's actually reading the book. It's having a diet on the word of God. I would also include with that scripture and also worship, singing, praying, being in fellowship with other believers. All of those things are what we should be dining on. That's what we want to be focusing on. So he says, eat what is good and delight in the richest fare. Verse 3, give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Covenant is a promise. Everlasting is an eternal promise. And he says, with you, my faithful love promised to David. Well, David was a person that God made a promise to, an everlasting promise. In fact, let me show it to you. This is from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 11 to 16. We read this. The Lord declares to you, that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over, David, and you're about to die, and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. That was going to be Solomon. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod, wielded by men, 
which means other nations punishing Israel, with flogging inflicted by human hands, but my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. How is that possible? Only through Jesus Christ. Only through Jesus Christ. This is one of the difficulties in Orthodox Judaism today. How do they answer this? How do they make a case that this throne has never ceased an occupant and, and who it is? It only works if it's Jesus the Messiah who holds that throne. And so he's comparing the covenant that he's now making with this other everlasting covenant. And he goes on. See, verse 4, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the people. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because the Lord your God. Who is this person who is summoning? I would argue it is the servant. I would argue it is the raised to life servant of Isaiah 53. And how is this fulfilled? Every nation in the world you go to, you will find Christians. Every nation in the world, you will find Christians. I think that's one of the amazing things that I've experienced as a pastor and traveling all over the world. When you're on the Great Wall of China, I bump into Christians. When I was in Mongolia, I bump into Christians. When I'm in Rwanda, I bump into so many Christians. When I'm in Ghana, I bump into Christians. When I'm in Jordan, I bump into Christians. When I was in Dubai, I bump into Christians. Nicaragua, Honduras, Hungary, you name it, wherever I have gone, there are believers. I have worshipped in their churches. I have preached in their churches. And I have this joy of knowing that God has done the fulfillment of this, the message of Jesus preached everywhere, and he has summoned the nations to him. Uh, because the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Now, who's the you? Um, one could argue, is it Israel? You could try to make that argument, I think it's the servant. I think it is the Messiah I think it ultimately is Jesus Christ. The word splendor, by the way, is the same Hebrew word for glory, kavod. And what that word is, the weightiness of God, the significance of God, the radiance of God, that which makes God, God, his glory, his splendor. That is what Jesus has so now comes an appeal. Could call it a gospel appeal. Seek the Lord while he may be found. This is verse 6. Call on him while he is near. This is a great verse for all of us. But when I am talking to somebody who I want to meet Jesus, which quite honestly is everyone I want to meet Jesus, but let's say it's somebody who's never come to faith. Yeah, I, don't, I want to give them time to ponder things and think about things. But the truth is, now is the moment. And the Apostle Paul alludes to this when he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. And so you're wondering, you know, should I pursue coming to faith? Yes! And when should you pursue it? Now! I, I, I wish I could make that clearer, but that is the ultimate joy, to see your friends, to see your brothers and sisters, to see your mom and dad, to see your son or daughter, come to faith in Jesus Christ. Seek the Lord while he may be found, because there is a season coming where he will not be found, and we are now in an open season by which you can seek the Lord. And we go on. Let the wicked forsake their ways, the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. Isn't that awesome? God says, give up the junk, come to me, and you know what? I forgive sin. This is the open door. This is the time to come in. And here's the amazing thing. Are there a certain amount of sins that God will accept and tolerate from you? 
but then you cross the line and you just have too many sins and you can't deal with it? No. But many of us think there is a limit. Here, here's the measurement we usually use. My sins are not that bad, and so God will forgive those. But your sins, uh, it's beyond the pale. Uh, he, he can't really forgive yours because it's just too bad, too, too much. That, I just want to address in a moment, because now comes the verse that is very important theologically. It's important to help us understand why does God allow things like COVID-19? How is it possible that there was a Holocaust of the Jews in World War II? How is it possible that there was an Inquisition? How is it possible that the abortion clinics are, are flowing? You know, why does this kind of stuff happen still? Well, I have questions. You have questions. And we like to ask those questions to God. So I may say something like this, God, if you're good, which I want to believe, then why is there COVID-19? To which God responds, and now here comes the theological statement. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The context is, how could God like forgive everyone? Because you may have somebody in your life that you don't want to see forgiven. And you don't understand why God would do that. That doesn't seem like justice, God. That person should be burning for what they're doing. To which God responds, I am thinking on a different plane than you are. And now here's where this verse is so powerful theologically and why most pastors, when they go to their ordination council, got to know this verse. It's because we are in a world in which we human beings have finite minds. They're little boxed in minds. We can't see things from eternity's perspective. We can't see things from a perspective of God. Have you ever seen you know, a vista where you can see like for miles and miles and miles? It really gives you perspective. But if you're in a closed in area, you do not have Perspective. If you are in a room that has no windows and you can't tell if it's raining outside or sunny outside, you just don't have perspective. And what God is saying, do you really think that your little mind can see things from my perspective? So I go, God, why are you doing COVID-19? I shake my fist. And God shakes his head and says, you just don't see it. The Apostle Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 13. Now we see as if through a glass darkly, that's King James, or a cloudy mirror or a dirty window. But then when we're with God, we will see face to face. This passage reminds us of our being finite. And it helps us say, Lord, I'm gonna trust you with the things that I do not know and that I cannot see. So very important theological verse. We go on, verse 10. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it, without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields its seed for the sower and the bread for the eater, now all of verse two, excuse me, verse 10, is building up to verse 11. Now verse 11 is another very important theological verse in quite truly is one of the reasons why I am doing this class right now. And if you're listening to me speak, why I actually have confidence that there may be something I say that might be redeeming and helpful for somebody. Here it is, verse 11. I'll read the previous just to give it context again. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it, without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields its seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return empty, but will accomplish what I desire 
This is the power of God's word. Here's what gives me great hope. Every now and then I preach and I go, oh, Steve, that was so lame. That was not a great message. That was not a good message. But no matter how bad my sermon might be, or even my class in teaching this midweek Bible class, here's the good news. If I am reading scripture in my sermon, in my class, this I know, God's word never returns void. It is like throwing seed on very fertile soil. Something is going to grow. Something is going to blossom. Now, this is a bookend to what the second part of Isaiah began with. Now, remember, Isaiah part two, we call it. Isaiah 40 extends to Isaiah 55. We're at Isaiah 55. We're at the end of that section. And this is how it began. Here's Isaiah 40. Whoops, that's not what I want. Uh, there we go. It says, a voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All the people are like grass. And all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fail because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are like grass. But here's the point. The grass withers and the flowers fail, fall. But the word of our God endures forever. The word of our God endures forever. And so we have this great hope. Uh, where am I now? Okay, we'll leave it at that. We have this great hope in our passage. So it is with my word that comes out of my mouth. It will not return empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose which I, what I sent it. God's word always has value. God's word in Isaiah 40 goes on forever. In Isaiah 50, the bookend, it is, it is always productive. It is always useful. So it goes on here. It says, you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Now, once again... Do you guys who've been in the church for a while, do you remember an old chorus? Uh, it was, it's kind of like a Jewish flavor song. I, I'm gonna sing for a second time today, so brace yourself, are you ready? You go, you, you will go out with song. Um, uh, how does it go now? <laughs> oh, you will go out with joy and lead it forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you. Uh, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Anyway, I won't sing anymore because I'm not doing very good. So yesterday, I'm working on this class, and I'm working with Pastor Nathan. We're in the same place together, practicing social distancing. He's like far away from me. But I mentioned this verse, and he starts singing the same song. And before you know it, both of us are doing the, the clapping thing. This is the message that salvation is a journey and it's a joyful journey. It's when you have received grace and now I am living in this grace. I am learning to trust in the infinite God because I just have a finite mind. I am knowing that his word is always fruitful and if I'm in his word, it's always going to be bearing fruit in my life and then it flows into with this, because I've had a quiet time, because I do participate in a Bible study, because I, I do participate in church on Sunday. I will go out with joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills, metaphorically, will uh, burst in the song and, and clap their hands. And then it wraps up this way. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper. Instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for the Lord's reputation, for an everlasting sign. That sign will endure forever. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that awesome? So what a great climax to this second section of the book of Isaiah. This could be in a quiz, by the way. Section number one, Isaiah 1 to 39. Section number two, Isaiah 40 to 
chapter 55, and you just came to the section. Now we're going to move into chapter 56, which raises a question. How do I live in God's new kingdom? In particular, because Christ hasn't returned yet. And, you know, even though I'm saved by grace, is there a code by which I live as a redeemed believer? And so this next section that Isaiah is going to give us is both a, a, a challenge to how we live and an anticipation of what God's kingdom looks like on earth while we are anticipating the culmination of events. So let's start with 56, and that's where we're going to wrap up today. I'm going to read it. This is what the Lord says. Maintain justice, do what is right. For my salvation is close at hand, and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the one who does this, the person who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps their hands from doing any evil. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name, better than the ones than sons and daughters, and I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them, besides those already gathered. Come, all you beasts of the field, come and devour all you beasts of the forest. Israel's watchmen are blind. They all lack knowledge. They are all mute dogs. They cannot bark. They lie around and dream. They love to sleep. They are dogs with mighty appetites. They never have enough. They are shepherds who lack understanding. They all turn to their own way. They all seek their own gain. Come, each one cries, let me get wine. Let us drink our full of, fill of beer, and tomorrow will be like today, or even far better. Kind of a downer ending, but this passage begins a new journey for us in terms of understanding how it is to live in God's kingdom. So flowing out of the previous section, what did we learn about God? God's ways are not our ways. Important theological verse. Uh, some reinforcing of this in the New Testament. Here's the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians. He says, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Now, think of this. Christ means Messiah. But we preach a crucified Messiah. A stumbling block for Jews, foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, or Messiah, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. I love this verse because it flows right out of the verse we just looked at in Isaiah 55. God's ways are not our ways. From our perspective, God's ways sometimes seems foolish, but his ways are not our ways. And the ultimate picture of the foolishness of God is that he would send a crucified Messiah to save his people. But it turns out that that foolishness from our perspective is our hope in our victory. Now, the other thing that I well, want to get into relates to uh, this passage 
right here, but we're going to get to that in just a moment. So I'm going to put this up here. So here it is, Isaiah 56. This is what the Lord says. Maintain justice, do what is right. How do we live as a grace-covered Christian? I'm saved by God's mercy, not by what I do. But I'm still called to live different. And here's the instructions. Maintain justice, do what is right. What does that mean? Well, you don't have to think too hard. Yesterday, I took my scooter to the Shelter Rec Church food pantry. And it was a lot of fun because News 12 came and they filmed us serving hundreds of people. It was a beautiful thing. And I think God received glory as they were celebrating. Last week, we were on Fox News where somebody says, I'm heading down to the, the uh, Shelter Rock Church food pantry. And once again, we saw great things happening. God receives the glory. That's justice. It's when I do something good and right because I am a follower of Jesus. It means that I'm caring for my neighbor, my friend, my son, my daughter, my church. Where I see somebody being wronged, I try to correct that wrong and see what I can do to fix that situation. That is what we are called to be. He says, maintain justice, do what is right. Do the right thing. Yeah, most of the time, there's not very gray to determine what is the right thing. Let me ask you, should you cheat on your taxes? Do the right thing. Uh, should you uh, squander things, you know, when you can be feeding someone else? Do the right thing. Should I be generous with my money? Should I take care of my mom? I mean, I'm taking care of my mom right now. She's in my house. It's a lot of work. I'm trying to do the right thing. That's justice. That is what is appropriate. For my salvation is close at hand, and my righteousness will soon be revealed. This phrase, righteousness, is going to show up in this last section of Isaiah, 56 to 66, 14 times. It's important. In other words, being grace-saved Christians does not mean I throw in the towel about trying to live rightly before God. You know what Israel's problem that got them into captivity was? They divorced religion from social responsibility. Religion is not about coming to church and punching your clock. It's that Christ is impacting every area of my life. And so in Acts chapter 2, the believers are sharing things in common. They are engaged in, in such a way that there is... No one hungry among them. That is what we should be. And so, as a Christian who is covered by grace, who the servant has carried our iniquities, now we live righteous. Verse 2, blessed is the one who does this. God will make that person happy, blessed, who holds fast to this, who keeps my Sabbath, this, Sabbath without desecrating it and keeps their hands from doing evil. Now, this may surprise you, and you say, is God bringing us back to the law? Keep the Sabbath? Now, let me ask you, when did God institute the Sabbath? Was it like in Exodus, and Numbers, Leviticus? No, it was on the very beginning, in Genesis chapter one, that he wired his creation to need rest which means not desecrating God's Sabbath. It's not saying because you go to church all the time on the Sabbath. It is saying that you are wired. Indeed, God views this as a social justice issue that you give rest to others and that you take rest for yourself. If this is possible for you, it is a good thing. Every time you try to get a chicken sandwich from Chick-fil-A on a Sunday and they don't have one because they're closed, thank God that there is a company that is making sure that there is a genuine Sabbath rest. And in the same sense, look at your schedule, and if you have no moment in your week, in your month, where you are getting a Sabbath rest, because that's what the whole point is about, getting rest, 
then you are not applying a social justice issue. That is the, the issue at hand. And now comes kind of a neat thing. Because God is saying, I am throwing open the doors to those who are lacking. No foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, let no foreigner bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. In other words, if you are not Jewish, don't say, well, I'm not very special. I'm not Jewish. I'm not one of God's chosen people. Forget that, God says. If you're bound to me, you're bound to me. And now he says something even more surprising. He says, and let no eunuch. Now, what is a eunuch? It is a formerly male person that has had their privates removed. And as a result, they are a eunuch. And they were often used in harems. This is something that is in pagan religions. And in this particular case, um, God is saying, even eunuchs who had their male private parts removed are welcome into my temple. Now, I want to uh, skip past this verse and go to this one here. No one, this is Deuteronomy, this is the law, the Torah. No one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter into the assembly of the Lord. So if you are a, a male who had your private parts crushed or removed, you cannot go into the temple of God. That's the law. You just can't do it. But now Isaiah is saying, huh, the Lord's adjusting this. He's saying, hold on, here's my word to the eunuchs. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me, who hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. There is a special place for eunuchs, for damaged people in God's new kingdom. Beautiful picture. Now, I want to go back. Do you remember when uh, Philip, who was an evangelist in the book of Acts, he was in the middle of a revival, and the Lord instructs him to go to the middle of the wilderness. And this is a little clip of the passage here. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Now this man was an Ethiopian eunuch. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless somebody explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. Do you remember that passage? That's Isaiah 53. We just covered this. Now we're reading in Isaiah 56 about the eunuchs being welcomed into the temple of God. Here's what makes this passage extra interesting. Apparently, this man was a God-fearer. That's a term for somebody who was not Jewish, but had come to understand that the God of Israel is God. He's an important official. He has money. He has resources. He comes from Africa, Ethiopia, or Cush, to Jerusalem. And while he is there, probably because he has money, he does something that very, very, very few people are able to do. Buy an actual scroll of the Hebrew Scriptures. I mean, now that you can get the Bible everywhere on your phone, we take this for granted. But nobody had copies of this. There would be one, maybe, in your synagogue. Most people, the Scripture they had, if they had it, was memorized. In other words, they just sought to memorize as much of the Bible as they could. Isn't it interesting that this Ethiopian, he goes to Jerusalem, he purchases a scroll, why the book of Isaiah? Of all the books in the Hebrew Scriptures to book by, I think it was because of the verse we just read. Because it was in Isaiah 56 that it says, To the eunuchs, you are welcome in my temple. And there is a name in my temple better than even having sons and daughters. So when we look at this passage in Acts, where Philip goes up to the Ethiopian eunuch, 
there seems to be a connection to why this eunuch purchased this Isaiah scroll. I think it was because it's the scroll that gives him a place in the kingdom. So verse 3 is, let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Foreigners are welcome, including eunuchs. He goes on, verse 6. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord, who minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain. Okay, you want to know how to live like a Christian today? You just got it right here. Who bind themselves to the Lord. What does binding yourself to the Lord look, at, look like? Here it is. Who minister to him. You serve the food pantry? You're not serving the people of law. I mean, you're serving the Lord. Minister before him. Who love the name of the Lord. You wake up in the morning and you say, good morning, Lord. I love him. I love him. Because he first loved me. And you just allow yourself to be captivated by the Lord. That is what this is talking about. Who are his servants? The Lord tells you to do something. You want to do it. You sense a prompting in your spirit to help someone. You help that person because you're a servant of the Lord. Who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it. Which means I am honoring that God wired me to need a day of rest. I am honoring that principle in my life. Who hold fast to my covenant. I read the Bible. I seek to honor what the scripture says. If I do these things, God says, come on up to my holy mountain. And so this chapter 56, moving on to 66, it's how do we live under grace, but as believers, it should impact the way we live. It should reflect in our justice and the choices we make. It says here, verse 7, These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Does that verse sound familiar to you? It should. If you read the New Testament, because it shows up in Matthew 21, Verse 3, it shows up in Mark, chapter 11, verse 17. It shows up in Luke, chapter 19, verse 4. All of those things convey God's house being a house of prayer. And there's one other verse I want to draw your attention to. Here we are. 1 Kings, chapter 8, verse 41. As for the far, this, by the way, this is Solomon's prayer. As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm when they come and pray towards this temple, then hear from your heaven, your dwelling place, do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, and do your own people as do your own people Israel, and may they know that this house I have built bears your name. So here's Solomon saying, Lord, let the foreigner come here and pray and hear their prayer. Here's what Jesus ultimately quotes this verse. Do you remember when? When he overturns the money changers in the temple. It's because church became a place that was not about prayer. It was about making money. You know, that's a great check for yourself, for me. Are you a prayerful person? And is corporate prayer a part of your life? And you can make corporate prayer pretty simple. Uh, one of the things that I do in my household every night before I go to bed, Michelle and I pray together. We hold hands and we, I pray, and then she prays, and then we kiss goodnight. By the way, she doesn't go to bed. I go to bed earlier than her. She stays up longer. But in all and through all, we do this every day. That's corporate prayer. Family dinner prayer, awesome. Do it as often as you can. Pastor Jerry says one of the things, of, nice things of COVID-19 is whole families together now. And they spend time praying together. Um, you know, family dinner. 
So make prayer a part of your life, and by God's grace, may this house of God be a house of prayer. It's important. I want to give a shout out to Pastor Frank for helping our church be a house of prayer. So, verse 8. The Sovereign Lord declares who he gathers, he who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. The summation statement here is Jewish people, it's not just about you. I am expanding my kingdom to include all the peoples of the earth, all who are willing to, as the text says, bind themselves to me, be bound. So, our passage now ends with kind of a downer note, and this is where we're going to wrap up today. Verse 9. Come, all you beasts of the field, and come devour all you beasts of the forest. Israel's watchmen are blind. Um, I'm going to move to the next section. Um, uh, actually, the next verse. It says, uh, Israel's watchmen are blind, for they lack knowledge. They are all mute dogs. They cannot bark. They lie around and dream. They love to sleep. They are dogs with mighty appetites. They, have, they never have enough. They are shepherds who lack understanding. They all turn to their own way. They all seek their own gain. And what is this referring to? Here's the closing statement of the section. Good leadership is important. It's extremely important. Who is this referring to? Okay, you're in this in-between stage. You're leading Babylon, you're coming home. You have a grace, and we live under the grace of Jesus Christ. Great news. We still need good leaders. What the critique here from Isaiah, or from the Lord ultimately, is that Israel's watchmen Israel's shepherds are lazy and self-consumed. Now, thank goodness we don't deal with that anymore and that all Christian leaders have their act together and they're all selfless. And you know that's not the case. I'm going to close with a poem from C.S. Lewis. It's called, As the Ruin Falls. I memorized it because I hate to say it's me. C.S. Lewis writes, all this is flashy rhetoric about loving you. I have never had a selfless thought since I was born. I am mercenary and self-seeking through and through. I want God, you, and all friends merely to serve my turn. Peace, reassurance, pleasures are the goals I seek. I cannot crawl one inch outside my proper skin. I talk of love, a scholar's parrot may talk Greek, but self-imprisoned always end where I begin. Only that now you have shown me, but how great the lack. I see the chasm, and everything I am is working is making my heart into a bridge by which I might grow and now the bridge is failing. And then the Lord comes in at the end of the poem and says, for this I bless you. As the ruin falls, the pains you give me are more precious than all other gains. Uh, I just messed up a few words there. If you want to look it up in the internet, C.S. Lewis called As the Ruin Falls. But this poem is about leaders like me, self-absorbed, think they're okay, think they're great, and in reality they're frail, egotistical, prideful. We need good leaders. And so as I close this class, I close with that prayer. Because in this season of grace, of which we're seeking to live in the covenant of grace, pursuing justice, I pray that we will be with good leaders and that the leaders we have will be humble enough to see their desperate need for the Lord. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you that we've had the time to spend a few minutes together on a Wednesday afternoon. I thank you that we have the ability to use an internet to grow us and still uh, become men and women who are under the teaching of God's word. Father, when I look at passages like this, I am reminded of my own frailty because I don't want to be one of these watchmen, these shepherds that are self-consumed and lazy. And yet I see the possibility in me to be that kind of thing. I remember Charles Wesley talking about when he was getting uh, older, excuse me, John Wesley, he, you know, he was waking up like seven instead of five and he felt that slothfulness was taking over him. Father, thank you that you have given us grace to work with frail leaders, but Lord, push us to be the kind of men and women that please you, that are bound to you, and that hunger to live the kind of lives that are honoring before you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for watching, and for those of you who are just tuning in to the recorded session, we're glad you're here too, and uh, we'll be having our regular class uh, on the following Monday. This coming Monday is uh, the 4th. This is the pre-recorded class we're, we're covering for now. And then the following Monday, it should be back to, to normal. Have a great week.